Good morning. I don't quite know how I'm going to follow Shrek in my presentation. Uh, whoever organized the guy from DreamWorks following the Scotsman from, uh, from Shrek Down Under, uh, nice job. And uh, as, uh, as he said in the introduction, it's very difficult to pronounce my last name. Uh, in fact, it was misspelled on the previous slide, so that just made my point. Thank you very much. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that I am uh, particularly intrigued with these days is how do we create, um, how do we take an enterprise, how do we take an organization of, of any size and really create an environment where creativity and innovation can really thrive? And, you know, these days, and all of these pictures are courtesy of Gensler, so if you're from Gensler, thank you. You know, almost not a day goes by where we don't see a new uh, news article or a story somewhere about uh, great work environments, great physical environments, amazing perks, free food, rock climbing walls, all these kinds of things seem to be the cornerstone of companies that are held up as innovators and of, you know, the, the highest levels of creativity. And I think all of these things are most definitely important. Um, I think in addition to that, we, we, we need to be thinking about a deeper set of human emotions on top of the physical, the, 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 the noticeable, the tactile attributes of creative environments. We need to be thinking about also a deeper set of human emotions. And there's, there's three concepts that we've been focusing on at DreamWorks that I'm excited to share with you about this morning. And, uh, and I, I have a little story that I'd like to share as well. This is a story that uh, has never been told outside of DreamWorks before. And, um, and, and hopefully what it will help do is to illustrate uh, some of these three concepts that I'd like to talk about. Now, just a quick history on DreamWorks. So, you know, we're known for family animated films, uh, these franchises, television specials, um, based on uh, Shrek Dragon, How to Train Your Dragon, Madagascar, the How to, how to um, how to Train Your Dragon and Kung Fu Panda, as, many, as well as many other properties that we've, that we've developed over the years. What, what mo many people aren't quite as familiar with is the fact that we've also developed some state-of-the-art production technologies, proprietary software that's used uh, in CG animation and computer graphics computing. And we've developed these and, and hold dozens of patents for this, for this kind of um, software development work. And over the last several years, we've become more known for our work environment, our, the, the, the way that we've built a community of both artists and highly technical people and, and bringing them together in a workplace to do amazing work and, and hopefully entertain the world with the images and the stories that we all see on the big screen. And so we've become known for that as well. And you know, Some people may think that, well, you're, you, know, you're, you make animated movies, creativity must just come naturally uh, at DreamWorks. And, and it really doesn't. It really doesn't. It's something that's in the ethos for sure but it also needs to be nurtured and managed and focused on every single day. We spend a tremendous amount of energy on that. You know, making an animated film is, is one of the most collaborative endeavors in the world. It takes almost 400 people working four and a half to five years to make a single animated film. And we release two or three films a year. And so at any given point in time, we have nine or 10 movies being developed and produced simultaneously. And so, so you know, the. The, 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 the question is, you know, that kind of collaboration, that kind of culture, and that kind of employee engagement is really, really critical to us. Because if you lose a key creative or a key technical talent from a project that takes four and a half to five years to make, it's really, really devastating. And so keeping people on these projects and really keeping them focused and doing their best creative and technical work is just absolutely important to us. And so the question comes up, of course, well, how do you go about doing that? Well, the first concept uh, that I'd like to share with you is, is that creativity requires trust. And, you know, in any creative enterprise, and, and you know, whether we're talking about new, new technology products or pharmaceuticals or making animated family films, there's an amount of give and take. There's an amount of back and forth, communication, iteration. It's those kinds of qualities, particularly open communication, that creates a level of transparency among people who work together. And it's that transparency that breeds trust. And it's that, for us at least, we have found to be really, really key. It's a key uh, glue, in a way, that, that, that binds the whole organization together. 
The second concept is one of risk. And anything that's original and unique is inherently risky. And if you're, again, if you're developing, if developing a new drug or, or, or a new consumer electronic, there's a huge amount of R&D, there's a huge amount of investment that goes into that, that type of endeavor. And that is inherently risky. This is especially true in, in, in the filmmaking business. Um, you know, a single movie that gets released literally will have its success determined in the first four days of release. So movies come out on a Thursday or a Friday. That first weekend, if that attracts an audience and it gets good word of mouth, it will be successful. If it doesn't, it will fail. At DreamWorks, we spend about $120 million in direct labor costs on each movie. And we spend about that same amount on marketing. So we're already a quarter of a billion dollars in on every movie that's released. That's not an unusual number in Hollywood. And so to make that kind of money back and to make films profitable, when particularly for DreamWorks Animation, where that's virtually all we do, it's incredibly risky. It's, it's, it's a nail biter, every movie release that comes out. Um, but, but, but it's creating a, a work environment where that kind of risk taking, we take huge risks on the business side, but taking, taking risks creatively in the environment is, is also very, very important. Maintaining original, original stories, original characters, all of these things are just inherent in what we do. And so really creating a place where risk taking is encouraged, not avoided, is, is very, very important to us. The third concept is that engagement requires a choice. And we certainly know for, um, you know, for millennials in particular, but for employees of, of, of all generations, having a sense of choice get, puts people in control. And whether that's a choice of benefits, a choice of projects to work on, whatever choices you can think about in your own environment, creating those kinds of choices and letting people have a say and some level of control in the work is very, very important to engagement. You know, a, a great example that I have found uh, is at Whole Foods. And I heard the CEO of Whole Foods speak at a conference a couple of years ago. And they've, they've developed this very interesting idea of choice in their organization. And for years and years and years, the senior management of Whole Foods would go out and visit their grocery stores and talk to employees. They have a very open culture there, very, very, um, very, very candid open communication from, from management to employees in the stores. And invariably, people would ask, oh, could we have this kind of benefit? Could we have this kind of perk? Could you do to have this kind of program for us? And almost invariably, they would say yes. And that's how they built up a very, very engaged, very, very, very motivated workforce. It literally got to the point where they couldn't afford to do it anymore. They could not layer on any more programs. And so rather than going out and saying no, which would be probably most of our reactions, like no, we've done enough, we can't spend any more. Instead what they did is they implemented a voting system where every third year, the entire workforce of Whole Foods votes on a new set of benefits. And so now, management still goes out in the stores and visits people, talks with them, they get questions about adding in programs, and instead of saying no, and instead of saying yes, they say, well, that's an interesting idea, put it on the ballot, and the next vote, if, if, your, if your coworkers agree, then we'll be able to add that kind of program. And so it's a very interesting idea, and it, it's, it, it's really based on the core um, human need of, of having choice and control over one's own life. And so at DreamWorks, we have no shortage of perks and benefits. We have a commissary that serves free breakfast and lunch every day. We have free yoga. We have all kinds of employee events on campus uh, going on all the time. We have Olympic-level hula hooping, which if you ever, have ever seen an Olympic-level hula hoop, it's insane. It's thick and heavy and you've got to be pretty, uh, pretty fit to actually do it. But we offer all of these things. And so we're always adding and tweaking our programs. And so literally, I think we've offered the last conceivable perk. And I get an email from an employee, which says, what about jujitsu? And I'm like, oh my god, I just can't take this anymore. So I'm sitting at my desk, and I reply back fairly quickly, and I say, well, actually, we have karate. It's on Tuesday nights. And he replies back nearly immediately and says, dude, karate is not jujitsu. <laughs> I know now, I did not know then. And so I'm sitting there like pulling my hair out and saying, who the fuck am I gonna blame for this madness? I can't take it anymore. And I decided that I'm blaming Maslow and that damn hierarchy of needs that we all know about. Right up there at the top, self-actualization, pursue inner talent and creativity fulfillment. Also known apparently as jujitsu. And so, you know, of course we offer jujitsu. I, 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 yes, I succumbed to jujitsu, um, and we now have that on Thursdays, and everyone, everyone who goes loves it. But 
Uh, joking aside, I, I think what we're seeing here is is not a trend. I mean, this is a real this is a real sea change, and you know, I, I, I see the day coming when you know free food and rock climbing walls and all, all of these things that um, you know are the hallmarks of creative companies. They become, I mean, they really become the new norm, and that's the new barrier of entry for attracting top talent. And so the question that I've begun asking that I think we all need to start talking about is what does it mean to have a work environment that helps employees move further up on Maslow's hierarchy? What does it mean to have programs that help employees self-actualize? This is something that we need to begin thinking about. I mean, does it mean that we're going to start offering artistic development programs on top of management training programs? Does it mean that we have to think differently about the way we, the way we give performance feedback to our people? And the, and the way that we measure their productivity. I think it, it causes us to rethink many of these kinds of things. And so uh, I'd like to tell you a story that, I, I, that will hopefully bring these, these three concepts a little bit more into focus. And the story starts back on the production of the first How to Train Your Dragon movie. And we had gone through what's in, in, uh, in this industry called a creative reset, which basically means the story and the characters were not working and we needed new leadership on the movie. And so we had two new film directors come on and join the film. And so typically when that happens, they need to go away and they need to rewrite the script and design new characters, and so this is what we did on that movie. So we shut down all production for about a month so the two directors could go off and kind of redesign what the characters looked like and what the storyline was going to be. And so uh, one of the departments that is, is really driven by character design is a department called Character Effects, or CFX. And these are guys and gals who uh, worry about all of the hair, cloth, uh, fur on all of our characters. Basically, all of the characters that we see on the big screen, other than the motion of that character's physical body, this team handles everything else. And so, you know, Stoic from How to Train Your Dragon, they're the ones who make sure his beard moves in the right way. They're the ones who make sure that Puss's uh, fur looks right. They're the ones who literally do cloth simulation to make sure all of the, all the character's clothing moves in a natural way so that it looks normal to us as we, as we see the film. So this is a group of about 25 people, and all of them are in their 20s and 30s. There's about five supervisors in the department, and all but one are in their 30s. And so this is important later in the story. So um, the, the, the group is getting pretty edgy. They're weeks into production delays. They don't have a whole lot to do. They're getting very, very frustrated, and they're getting very scared and nervous that whatever the character designs that the new directors come up with, how are they going to deal with it? And so the supervisors are getting nervous, and they're, and they're trying to keep their team motivated and focused, despite the fact that there's a lot of anxiety and stress going on. And so um, one, of the, one, one evening after hours, uh, the lead supervisor on, on How to Train Your Dragon started wandering around his department just checking on people. And he noticed in the wall uh, an access panel. If you work in any kind of office building, you know, you know there's access panels in the walls that, you know, for maintenance and things like that. And so over the course of several days, he uh, is able to open the access panel and starts exploring what's behind it. And what's behind it, of course, is kind of an, an attic wall space. It's under the pitch of a roof above our loading dock. And so um, he kind of goes deep back in there and starts exploring what's going on. And uh, no one other than his team is aware that he begun this little exploration of his. And so, cut to about nine months later, and uh, an employee passes to me uh, a stack of coasters, which has this design on it, which looks like that. So I got a stack of these. And at the top it says CFX, and in the middle it says HR. And so I'm thinking, wow, they do have time on their hands. They're designing coasters for the HR department. <laughs> um, but hey, you know what? If they love HR, I love them. It's great, awesome, what a fabulous creative company we work for. Um, and then I flip it over, and on the back there's kind of this cryptic stamp. It says 9 slash 3 dash 530, which of course doesn't take me long to figure out that's a date, a date and time. And so I start asking around about this, like what, 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 what is this coaster for? What, what does this mean? What's the stamp mean on the back? And everyone seems genuinely freaked out that the head of human resources is asking about this. So I'm, I'm like, okay, now I'm on to something. I'm, now I'm starting to be convinced this is not a coaster for the HR department. This might be something else. And so um, nine months after, 
uh, this little exploration, uh, I finally discovered that HR does not stand for human resources, but instead it stands for hidden room. And apparently the date and time on the back was the date and time of a gathering of employees from the CFX department in the hidden room. And so uh, this is what it looked like. So uh, these, these supervisors literally disassembled a full-size grandfather clock, that fake fireplace, that sofa, those chairs, the tables, disassembled those things, stuffed them through that access hatch and rebuilt them on the inside. Nine months. Nine months, yes. So, you know, clearly the supervisor needed some help. And, but he didn't need psychological help. What he needed was help getting his team focused and motivated and inspired um, through a difficult time. Now, of course, we nearly shut the thing down. We nearly fired the supervisors who created it. How dare they? How dare they break through a hatch and build something like this? There was a lot of soul searching going on for us when that happened. And, you know, in the end, uh, we, we, we kept it open. We brought it up to code. We covered the sprinkler heads properly. We made it safe. We cut a larger door in case there was something people could get out. So we actually kept it and made it safe. And, and I think that this was a real turning point in our culture and our environment. And this space has become uh, famous both internally and externally. We've had, uh, we've had actors and actresses visit. We've had famous filmmakers like James Cameron and Guillermo del Toro come in and visit. And so, you know, this is something that, that we have celebrated. Um, and we celebrated the managers for going to those kinds of lengths to keep their team as motivated and inspired as possible. But there were some big lessons for us. Um, this is a couple more examples of the kinds of things that we do in the space now. But, you know, the lessons of the hidden room for us, um, the first one is know what's behind your access hatches. So everyone's going to go back to work tomorrow and you know, unlock those access hatches and see what the hell's going on behind there just to make sure. Um, but, but what this really means is trust your people, and that trust will be reciprocated. We trusted that, that their concern for their team was absolutely genuine and really, really, really wanted to keep, do something unique and original for their team. Uh, the second is don't unwittingly shut down creativity and innovation. <coughs> You know, DreamWorks, like many other companies, puts itself up as a creative and innovative environment and culture. And if we had shut this effort down, we would be doing the exact opposite of what we espouse ourselves to be. And we realized that. And so we really wanted to remain congruent between our, 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 our messages and our actions. And so that, that, was, that was very much part of our thought process in, in uh, just bringing it and making it safe. and, and um, and there's really no management oversight of the space whatsoever. The team continues to manage and, and make sure that everyone who goes there has fun and is safe. Um, the third is get a clue. This was a big lesson for us. Get a clue about what millennial managers mean, what they need. They need a different set of tools. They think very, very differently about the way that they can motivate and inspire their team. And all of the traditional things that corporate management would, would teach and offer managers to motivate and encourage their team they may or may not work. And I think it's unique in everyone's environment. But I do think we need to think differently about what millennial managers are gonna need going forward. Um, and so this brings me back to you know, these three key themes for us, which, as I said before, there's no real easy answers to some of these kinds of challenges. But you know, I, I believe uh, uh, deeply that if we really wanna be able to grow uh, an organization and a workplace where creativity and innovation can, can truly thrive and flourish, that these three uh, emotions, human emotions, um, and needs are things that we should spend a bit more time focused on and thinking about. Thank you very much.